Hi, welcome to the Passionate Minds course content review tutorials. Today we'll be covering the Chemistry of Life Basics Part 1 of the Grade 12 curriculum. So a lot of this course is based on a good understanding of chemical interactions. Therefore, it's important that we review the chemistry. This will help ensure that you understand the complex biochemical concepts that will be taught later in the course. 96% of living matter consists of elements like oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. The other 4% consists of stuff like calcium, like phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chlorine, and magnesium. The elements that are present in less than 0.01% that are required for life are called trace elements. And these include iron, so Fe, uh, iodine, I, and copper, Cu. Okay, so iron is required for oxygen transport as a part of hemoglobin. Iodine is responsible for hormone production in the thyroid gland. And copper is responsible for many metabolic enzymes, such as cytochrome C oxidase. All matter consists of extremely small particles called atoms, which are the smallest unit of any given element. So each atom consists of the same basic structure with the following subatomic particles that are indicated on this diagram here. So you have a nucleus that consists of protons and neutrons. And you also have electrons that are in the orbiting clouds that will fall into various orbitals. So each element has a symbol recognized worldwide and that, that is seen on the periodic table. This next part will introduce the concept of isotopes. So isotopes have the same number of electrons and protons. So these are the same. But the only thing that differs between them is the number of neutron which are different. So because they have the same number of electrons and protons, all isotopes of an element therefore have the same chemical properties. Isotopes can also be radioactive when the nucleus decays spontaneously, and that will make it unstable. So this has implications. Isotopes are radioactive when the nucleus decays spontaneously, making the overall compound unstable. So there are two applications we can discuss regarding radioactivity. So the first would be radioactive dating. So in radioactive dating, what happens is each radioactive isotope has a half-life before it decays into another element. So half-life. Right. So the, the half-life is the time it takes for half of the nucleus in a radioactive sample to decay. So by calculating the half-life of an atom, scientists can identify the age of a fossil using an exponential relationship, as well as a radiation counter to assist in that process. In a second application, there's something called radioactive tracing, which uses radioactive tracers. So radioactive tracers, these are radioisotopes that are used to follow chemicals through chemical reactions and trace their path as they move through the bodies of various organisms. So these also have numerous medical applications. So in this example here, uh, iodine-131 is an isotope that is used to identify the presence of cancer cells in thyroid gland here. So as you see right here, radioactive iodine is ingested and then radioactive iodine molecules are absorbed by the wall of the stomach and the intestines. And then what happens is the thyroid gland will use the remaining or any iodine that is present and it'll absorb uh, some of that radioactive iodine. And as a result, the radiation will destroy the cancer cells that are present in the thyroid gland. Uh, a third application involves radio immunotherapy in which doctors inject antibodies that have isotopes attached to them. These antibodies will then flow to the bloodstream and bind to proteins on the cancerous cells. So radioimmunotherapy will treat blood cell cancers like leukemia and lymphoma. 
The chemical behavior of an atom depends mostly on the number of electrons in its outermost shell. So this is known as the valence shell. So this, in this case, it would be this outermost shell here. Okay, so the valence shell electrons are those electrons that are available for bonding, and those are the reactive electrons that participate in the reactions. The number and arrangement of its valence electrons in an atom determines its overall behavior and its characteristics. Electrons have something called potential energy, which uh, is due to their attraction to the protons in the nucleus and their overall position in the atom. So let's say you have an electron in the first energy level, so the first shell here, and you want to move it to the valence shell, so the second energy level. To do that, you need to put in energy, so energy needs to be absorbed in order to go to the next valence shell, to the valence shell. Let's say that it's vice versa, so from the second energy level to the first energy level, uh, to do that, energy must be lost. You must release it. In general, it is difficult to predict the path of an electron. So instead of using the classic 2D model, scientists have predicted the space around the nucleus where electrons are most likely found. It's a term called orbitals. Scientists use electron shell diagrams in order to communicate effectively the use of these orbitals. So each shell is shown here with its maximum number of electrons grouped in pairs of two. So there's max two electrons in the first shell, eight in the second shell. So over here, you can see that this is a 1x orbital. Uh, this one, in, this over here introduces a 2s orbital. And you're going to see that there's three 2p orbitals that are present here. So it's seen like this. Okay, so in each orbital, you will have two electrons that are present. Atoms react to achieve stability, so they must undergo bonding. During bonding, an energy exchange occurs, and atoms assume a more stable configuration in which they complete their outer shell to form chemical bonds. What happens is this will result in a formation of a compound. So a compound consists of at least two different kinds of atoms. Here, you see that there is the sharing or transfer of electrons, which result in chemical bonds. Uh, for the formation of sodium chloride over here, what happens is that opposite charges attract to form ionic bonds. Uh, so a metal and a non-metal here will transfer electrons to form an ionic compound. So this is an ionic compound. Uh, for the formation of hydrogen chloride over here, a, uh, two nonmetals will share electrons to form a molecular, so covalent compound. So this, elect this will take this electron here and then you'll result in the formation of this molecular compound, which has an electron d density that looks like this. When two nonmetals share electrons to form a covalent compound, you can have two types of covalent bonds. So you can have a polar covalent bond or a nonpolar covalent bond. So in a polar covalent bond, you're going to have unequal sharing of electrons but in a nonpolar covalent bond you're going to have equal sharing of electrons so th these features here are determined by the atom's electronegativity so electronegativity is a measure of an atom's ability to attract a another atom's shared electron pair when it's participating in a covalent bond with another atom. So what happens is when you have increased electronegativity, you're going to have a stronger pull of shared electrons towards this atom. So let's talk about HCl, for example. So Cl, chlorine, is 
more electronegative. So you're going to have a pull of electrons towards chlorine. This means that in a covalent bond, the atom with the stronger electronegativity will have a stronger pull on the electrons in the other atom. To determine electronegativity, you use a scale called the Pauling scale. So the Pauling scale helps you determine electronegativity. So let's take HCl again, for example. All right, so uh, when you use the electronegativity chart, you're given a set of numbers. So in, if you look into that chart that's given, you can see that H, so hydrogen, has an electronegativity, electronegativity of 2.1. Chlorine has an electronegativity of 3.0. So in this case, you can see that the hydrogen has a partial positive charge and the chlorine has a partial negative charge. So the higher on the uh, scale, the more electronegative the atom. Okay, so in this case, you're, if you subtract these two values here, the biggest minus the smallest, you're going to get 0 0.9. So what does 0 0.9 mean? So when you look at the electronegativity differences, what happens is if you have a non-polar bond type, your electronegativity difference will be between 0 to 0 0.5. If you have a polar bond type, you're going to have an electronegativity difference of 0 0.5 to 1.7. But if you have an ionic bond, you're going to have an electronegativity that is greater than 1.7. Let's take water, for example, here. So water has a hydrogen that has a partial positive charge and oxygen that has a partial negative charge as you will determine these values based off the table that is given with the electronegativity values so shared electrons will spend more time near the oxygen nucleus in this case as because it's more electronegative so as a result the oxygen atoms will gain a slightly negative partial charge and the hydrogen atoms become more positively charged